أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ففهمناها سليمان وكلنا أتينا حكمة وعلما رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحانك لما وحنا نيك ألم لا تنسني ولا تنسني الحمد لله أفضل الحمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله وسائر النبيين وصالحين وسلم ألم وفقني وحدني وسددني وجمالي بين الصواب والثواب وعدني من الخطي والهرمان آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of Q&A Question and answers where we sit here on this uh, pretty blue sofa and make all effort to respond to your queries, whatever they may be. Queries can be questions which are troubling you over the last sort of few days, some event which has taken place, which has brought something to the fore of your mind where you want to seek some clarity on, or it might be something which has been bugging you for many months and years and you've always wanted to put it to a scholar but not had the opportunity. Well, that's what we are here for. Uh, the show is called Q&A. Well, you'll need a number in order to ring in, and that's 01274 214 299. That's 01274 214 299. And you will get through to our beautiful studio here uh, in Bradford, the Icra Studios. Now, I did mention, I think probably a week or so ago, that obviously scheduling is about to change over the next sort of few weeks or maybe even the next few days, to be honest, um, in which uh, less time will be given to kind of delivering a lecture as such. And uh, we will look to the needs of the wider community beyond our shores. Even having said that, there still will be an opportunity uh, in those particular times for you to ring in and ask your questions. However, we know that one of the greatest months in terms of acts of worship is nearly upon us. And that month is Ramadan, I appreciate. We are still in Rajab yet, and we still have maybe about 10 days or so left of Rajab. So there's still a considerable amount of time left. And then obviously, first we will go through Sha'ban. Once we've been through Sha'ban, we will get to Ramadan. But I find usually, year in, year out, we tend to get the same questions uh, put to us uh, by individuals and I'm, I'm sort of taking a, a proactive step uh, rather than a reactive step this time around. So I think if I could spend you know today, tomorrow and Friday inshallah ta'ala and maybe even if I get opportunity next week is to deliver to you the kind of common questions that we get. We have in fact put a treatise together, uh, 60 pages uh, A4 size in fact on that particular topic which has been growing over the years. This started off about four years ago, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a couple of colleagues and I sat down and we started to put together the common kind of like, you know, FAQs that we say, don't we? Frequently asked questions. And we've put it together in a uh, PDF document, which is available from the website, the Wifaqul Ulama website, .co.uk. If you go on there and you go to the link which speaks about Ramadan, you will find that it should be there somewhere at the top and you'll be able to download the PDF or you can view that PDF on your phone or tablet or any other device that might, you might be using. So I think it's uh, useful to venture through that first. First, I think what we should do is look at the topic of fasting itself. Now, fasting is an obligation. Uh, okay, we have a caller who's called in, so let's take that call first, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear caller. Well, brother. Uh, yeah. Just what I say, I mean, obviously, it's, um, I don't know if it's going to be relevant what today is, but uh, Bradford, Manchester, you know, a lot of the areas, even Birmingham, where there's high populations of Muslims, we find, unfortunately, um, high crime, um, there's a lot of drug dealers, and another petty, well, it's not a petty thing, but there's rubbish, I mean, uh, uh, where the Muslims live, seems to be the most messiest places uh, in in the areas. Um, yet we're told, as our religion, to keep things clean. Um, and the mosques, I don't know, they don't, they're not addressing this problem at all, probably because of fear of the congregation or what. I don't know. But th these issues are very serious because how many non-Muslims see what Muslims are doing and decide... No matter what happens, I'm never going to be a Muslim because it's the Muslims that are keeping our country a mess and causing criminality. 
you know, and we need to sort this out. I mean, uh, um, we can make excuses, but you never see gangs of Hindu kids on the street. I've never seen a gang of Hindu kids on the street. You come to Manchester, Birmingham, or wherever, there's gangs of Muslim, uh, Pakistan, well, gangs of Muslim kids selling drugs and being antisocial. Yeah. Jazakma, so what, what, yeah. what are your views on this? No, Jazakma here for that point and that observation. Uh, and in fact, you, you, I'm sure you're not going to be surprised that you're not the first person who's made that observation and obviously made those points. And I feel your hurt, and I obviously uh, resonate the, and reciprocate the same issues that also we face here uh, in, in Bradford or anywhere else for that. Uh, there's new, the, the thing is, there's no one simple solution. However, obviously, there needs to be a solution. And there's no simple uh, kind of causative effect the, the, the cause of why this happens. It's multi-pronged. Um, you know, one of the things is obviously socio-economic background. The second is the areas which we tend to uh, reside in. They tend to be inner city areas. We tend not to live in areas uh, further out. So for instance, if you live in inner city, you're going to access uh, things which most people won't access. So, you know, when it comes to, say, the selling of drugs, when it comes to that kind of scene, when it comes to the nightlife, call it nightclubs and, and things like that, that's going to happen around those areas like the inner city, places where people wouldn't normally take up residency. You tend to find cheap housing there. So because our communities tend not to be uh, sort of financially uh, affluent as such, to move out into uh, more affluent areas, more uh, you know areas where they can afford better housing, then they continue to to live in those areas. So they will always be under that kind of influence. And again, I'm not giving these as excuses. So please don't think that I'm giving these as excuses. I'm just giving you these are asbab which are understood. And this is no different to say, for example, if you were to travel uh, to other areas like, for example, places in Wales, uh, places in uh, Scotland, particularly Glasgow, and other areas where there is a predominant uh, non-Muslim community. Wherever you find kind of inner city, wherever you find social economic issues, uh, you will find uh, crime and you will find obviously uh, crime of an even more significant nature like murder and things like that. You know, let's, let's take London for example and you will find that the so-called black on black crime is significantly high. Uh, and uh, if you look at the sort of prison population, you will also find that the uh, uh, B BAME community tends to make up a significantly higher proportion, relatively speaking, uh, to the community uh, at large. So these are realities that we face. The difference one could argue about the Muslim population is that supposedly we have the answers. OK, supposedly we have the answers just to go back a bit, actually, is, you know, you also mentioned that, you know, we don't tend to see, say, gangs of Hindus or or, or gangs of, of maybe Sikhs or, or, or people of that uh, nature, which may have come from similar backgrounds. Uh, why don't we see that? Well, again, if we trace our predecessors arrival in the UK, you'll find that particular. And I think you, you mentioned uh, the word Pakistani and then you you sort of pulled it back, uh, realizing that you didn't want to make it an ethnic issue. Uh, however, I think, you know, we need to sort of bear it all. You'll find that those communities who've come from, uh, say, in the Pakistan area, have come from deprived areas, uh, low literacy, uh, low level of education. So the, the, they are, and they're traveling here or their parents came here in order to seek employment. And that employment would have been something of, a, of manual labor or menial. It wouldn't have been, have been a, a technical job or a qualified job. Whereas people who are particularly coming from India and they chose to travel to uh, England or any place in Europe, they were coming for, for technical jobs, uh, for qualified jobs. So there is that educational difference, there is that social difference and, and economic difference and we cannot shy away from that. So I just wanted to make that point. Moving forward uh, with regards to why we particularly, it hurts us more. And again, the caller mentioned that in his, in his, in his, uh, in his sort of statement, in his question, which is that surely we believe we have the answers. You know, we are at the Huru uh, Shatrul Iman. Purity is half of faith. And, you know, that's, forget half of uh, akhlaq, uh, half of adab, it's half of Iman, faith. And that's fundamental to defining you as a Muslim. Never mind good character or uh, good traits or good qualities. The fact that your your actual religion is based on on purity, 
And we see that, you know, we, 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 we uh, feel very confident. We feel very, you know, I won't use the word proud, but we feel somewhat uh, privileged that we were taught the mechanisms and the manner in which to answer the call of nature. Uh, you know, not restricting ourselves just to the use of, a, of an absorbent like a tissue paper, but going beyond. We also feel somewhat um, privileged that we were taught about the purification, the ritual purification process of wudu, and then the spiritual purification of salah, and similarly the financial purification of zakah, and also the spiritual purification of zakah. Similarly, uh, the fasting, uh, again, another purification. So, in fact, every aspect of our deen seems to be based around purification. And, and what we see, unfortunately, is quite the opposite. And the unfortunate thing is, is that as a, an identity, we have lost that identity. So, even when our forefathers originally arrived on these shores, and they may not have been religious in the, in the, in the, in the sense of the word, uh, but they had religious upbringing. So, and they may have packaged it as a social uh, or as a cultural uh, identifier, but in reality it was a religious identifier, even though they perceived it as a cultural identifier, or rather they practiced it as a cultural identifier. And you saw that, you know, if you wanted good, hard-working people who, with no nonsense, then you'd find that the ethnic minorities were very hard-working people who got on with it and were very principled, honest, fair, and all the other qualities that we would have. Unfortunately, the youth that's been uh, gro growing up now in, in, in these communities, in these societies, they've not been given that same cultural upbringing so they don't have the same kind of principles that that the people who first arrived here have and then they're getting kind of pulled apart because they do not recognize their parents uh, as being of the same sort of uh, social cultural circles that they're growing up in so they can't connect uh, with their parents they then look at the indigenous white population and the indigenous white population is already we've seen throughout even though we try again and again and again unfortunately we find society to be racist that's just the way things are. And we've seen examples of that, whether it's in public bodies, like even in the police force, uh, maybe not so much in this country, but in, say, in the United States of America, we've seen that. And we can see, and we've also seen, you know, Brexit was a fine example of how some people perceive people from the BAME community and how they do not value their interests. So you get so you get a kind of refusal, or rather you cannot connect with your parents or grandparents, so due to that generational difference, you cannot connect with the indigenous white population uh, because of racism. So the young people growing up are lacking a, an identity. So they need an identity. And also what you find is that when the young people are oppressed or, or pushed down, then the natural reaction is, unfortunately, is to show uh, aggression in return because they're not being taught how to deal with, uh, you know, s sort of being in uh, scenarios where the odds are against you, being the underdog. And you see that kind of more violent approach being adopted as a consequence. How do we solve this? Well, to be honest, you know, every problem starts at home. Uh, and uh, I just want to pick up on that point where you said, you know, the masjids or the mosques aren't dealing with it. Um, where I have been, uh, where I have lectured myself in, in masajid, uh, similarly where I've heard colleagues uh, lecture in masajid, whether it's for Juma Salah or any other program, I know many of the ulama. And I'm not saying that because you might say, well, okay, you know, you're bound to say that. But I'm ge generally, genuinely saying that. Um, many ulama uh, do go out of their way uh, in order to address these issues with the public. It may not get seen in the limelight. Uh, this is one way which is a manifestation of it. Here we are, you know, sitting for an hour or so and engaging with, with the public in order to try to solve the, the, the society's problems, uh, not just um, sort of seeing that it's the scholar's problem, it's society's problem. But let me give you, let me give you the Juma example. Okay? In Juma Salah, the Imam Sahib will sit, the Khatib will sit, prior to the Juma Khutbah, for maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, addressing issues. Now, you, he may, yes, deal a lot with religious issues, and sometimes we take issue with that, that, hold on, why is he talking about religious issues and not about social issues and the social ills? Uh, they do get around to the social ills, but getting an audience, unfortunately, is very difficult. So if you go to the masjid, let's just say now, for example, Juma Salah is one o'clock in the UK in most masajids, which will obviously change once the uh, hours go forward in spring, 
and you make your way to the masjid say at 1230, 1235, whatever it is. I appreciate with, with, with lockdown and with social distancing, we may go there a little bit earlier in order to ensure we get a space. But imagine the good old days uh, when there was no such thing as social distancing and we could get to the masjid and, you know, getting to the masjid 20 minutes before still ensured you got a space. But let's just say somebody turns up um, at 1230 and you look around in the masjid, who are the sorts of people you're going to see? You're going to see the bazurgs as we call them, the elder generation, the Urdu speaking or, you know, native tongue speaking as in indo Pak speaking. Uh, elder generation, they're going to be in the first surfs and the second surfs. You look around and you will struggle. I'm not saying you won't see any, but you will struggle to see individuals, you know, in their 20s, uh, in their 30s, uh, in their late teens. You, you won't see that. You may see some 40, 50 year olds, but you're definitely going to see the 60 and 70 year olds. And then you wait and you wait and you wait. And when it gets to about 10 to 1, 5 to 1, then you see that age range making their way to the masjid. And then, you know, trying to sneak in or pray near the Shurak area or whatever. Now, how can the Imam Sahib address these issues when the audience is not there? And uh, as soon as the khutbah is prayed in Arabic and the salah is prayed, literally even before the Imam has made his second salam, people are already getting up to leave. So what is Imam Sahib, Imam Sahib supposed to do? Lock the doors. He can't do that. So you can see that we have these issues. They are communal issues. Of course, we can use religion as a means to solve them. But unfortunately, not many people see religion as a solution. And I don't mean just to this call, this issue. I mean generally, unfortunately, they don't. When people are having marriage problems, they don't turn to, to religion as a way of a solution to that. Instead, they'll just argue and argue and argue, um, give his wife divorce, you know, 100 times. And then finally, somebody will decide to ring a scholar up. The scholar will say, unfortunately, your wife's divorced from you. And then the blame is put on the scholar for saying that my wife's divorced from me. So, you know, it's, it's, it's the community themselves that have to now kind of get off, uh, get on their feet. The ulama are there as advisors and as instructors. They are not really the leaders of society. The community do not see them as leaders of society. Uh, I'll give you another example. In the masjid itself, the Imam Sahib is not actually a leader there. He's a paid employee. It is the trustees that are the leaders there. They run the organization, which in this case is the masjid. The Imam Sahib, poor chap, is a paid staff member and he will follow his rules that have been given to him and his terms and conditions, which he has signed up to for the contract to be an imam. And if he's not allowed to talk about certain topics, the trustees will say, unfortunately, you cannot talk about these topics. We don't want you to talk about these topics. We want you to talk about X, Y and Z. Now, he can refuse and potentially get sacked or he has to abide by his contractual obligation. It is the community that run the masjids, not the Imam Sahib. It is the community that elects or selects the masjid committees. And the masjid committees are those, normally, or usually you find that a masjid is, is registered as a charity, and that charity obviously is, is, is supervised by the charity commission. So it is up to, and that obviously has some form of agreement, some uh, terms of reference in which how it operates. So this I put back to the community. It is up to the community when the community is sick and tired of that, when the community starts to report people who are doing illegal activities, then you will start to see a change. Where the community doesn't get involved uh, and, and, and kind of, you know, kick the can further down the road, unfortunately that solution will not get de dealt with. The ulama are the experts. They are there for us to go and talk to them and they will give us expert advice and opinions on the issue of religion. When it comes to these sort of social issues, and if we want the masjid to be more uh, a stronger place, a more religious place, if we want the ulama in the masajid to have more influence, then we have to give them that influence. Um, I, I, I'm just speaking to somebody who, who teaches in a, in a masjid, and uh, I was just asking about what fees they have for the children. And he said, five pound. So I thought he said, so what was that? He said, five pound, we charge the children five pound for maktab. And I said, okay, how, how many hours is that? He says, two hours. And I said, oh, is that two hours over the five days? He goes, no, no, two hours per day. So I said, okay, let me get this right. Five days, two hours a day is 10 hours. And, you, and com people from the community pay five pound? Okay, so I said, wow, that's like what? You know, my maths is reasonably good. That's five divided by 10 is what, 50p? So basically 50p an hour? I said, you can't get a childminder for 50p an hour. 
You can't get a 14, 15 year old girl or boy to mind your children who do, and they do nothing but play on their phone and just make sure your children don't kill themselves. You pay them maybe 10, 15 pound an hour. And we pay people in the must, or we pay the uh, money to the, towards the teaching of our children at 50p an hour. Now, if that's the value we give to religious learning, then what do we expect to happen in our communities? Once we start to value, and you know, I also am involved in teaching, and if you ask somebody how much do they pay for Abdullah's uh, private tuition to get his GCSEs, they'll say we pay £20 an hour, and they won't bat an eyelid. And you'll say, wow, that's a lot. You pay £20 an hour for GCSE maths. Yes, I do, £20 an hour. And yet that same person will be sending his younger son to the masjid and he will be quibbling over £5 an hour, uh, sorry, £5 an hour, £5 a week, which works out to be 50p an hour. We, we reap the harvest we sow. Until we start to deal with this and take this seriously, then it's the moral side of our children that will be destroyed. And that's what we're seeing on our streets. Now, our children might get good GCSEs and our children might get good jobs afterwards. But the bottom line is that what the moral issue that we will face, we will continue to face. Now, I'm going to stop it there because I've been told there's another caller waiting. So uh, apologies, uh, dear caller. Uh, we have a couple of minutes. So please, please, if you could uh, uh, put your question to us. Uh, hello. Hello, Salaam Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Mullen Sahib, can I speak in Urdu? Ji, ji, ji. I want to say that the uh, society and uh, ulmai kram and as a whole, we have all the responsibility to give a lot of attention to the people. Because you see that something... हमारी प्रायोरिटीज क्या है कुछ पहनियां बच जाती हैं तो मस्जिद के डिब्बे में डाल दो और एक एक सौ पौंड का सूट हम पहनते हैं और इतनी इतनी अगर बच्चों की दुनिया की तालीम के लिए दुनिया की तालीम के लिए हम जमीन और आसमान एक कर देते हैं अपने घर बेच देते हैं अपने जायदाद बेच देते हैं कि ये डॉक्टर बन जाए इंजीनियर बन जाए या कोई किसी मकाम पे पहुंच जाए लेकिन उसके साथ जो जिस जिसमें हमारी निजात है जो मजबी तालीम है उसके लिए हमारी क्या प्रायोरिटीज हैं कि पांच पौंड जिस तरह आपने जिक्र किया कि पांच पौंड हम नहीं दे सकते हम आ, कहते हैं कि ये भी बहुत ज्यादा है मतलब हमारी प्रायोरिटीज होनी चाहिए हमें उस लेवल पे हम बच्चों को स्कॉलर बनने के लिए कितनी हम कोशिश करते हैं और कितने बच्चे स्कॉलर्स बनते हैं लेकिन उसके बरक्स अगर दूसरी तालीम की तरफ मैं ये नहीं कहती कि दूसरी तालीम बहुत जरूरी है लेकिन कम अज कम कम अज कम एक बेसिक एजुकेशन का सिस्टम तो होना चाहिए हमारी सोसाइटी में लेकिन अवेयरनेस नहीं नहीं है अगर उलमाए कराम भी दीन को लेकर चलेंगे सिर्फ दीन और अल्लाह के नाम के एक साथ लोगों को जोड़ेंगे तो फर्क इतने ज्यादा है एक दूसरे के ऊपर कीचड़ उछालना और दूसरों को नीचा दिखाना और अपनी मनवाना अब मैं एक आम मैं स्कॉलर नहीं हूँ लेकिन अल्लाह ताला ने हर बंदे को एक अलहदा बनाया है हर बंदे की एक सोच होती है तो आपको रिस्पेक्ट करनी चाहिए दूसरे के व्यूज की भी दूसरों की कदर करनी चाहिए और इतना दुख होता है इतना दुख होता है कि कुछ वो खुदा जिसने हमें इस दुनिया में भेजा है एक टेस्ट है हमारे लिए बार बार कुरान में बताया गया हदीस में बताया नबी करीम सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि वसल्लम ने अपनी जिंदगी में हमें बताया कि किस तरीके से आपने जिंदगी गुजारनी है कुछ पहनियां बच जाती हैं तो वो मस्जिद के डिब्बे में डाल दो ये हमारा मैार है सोच का तो फिर हम हमारी निजात कहां होगी जी जी बिल्कुल जजाक अल्लाह खैर बहन जी अभी इसके जवाब तो मैंने आपसे पहले भी दिया जैसे आपने कहा कि हम दीन और ये जो आदाब है वो आखिर करते हैं तो इसलिए हम भी ऐसे बन गया तो अभी सो फॉर नाउ सॉरी आई एम जस्ट गोना कम इन टू आवर ब्रेक सो प्लीज जॉइन मी अगेन सेम नंबर 0127421429 बट कॉल मी आफ्टर द ब्रेक स्पीक सून अस्सलाम वालेकुम